Hello my dears and welcome back to my corner of the internet. I'm Shannon and today we have another book talk video to share with you guys. And today we're talking about A Good Neighborhood by Therese Ann Fowler. I picked this book up on kind of a whim. I saw it on a upcoming um, new release list that my friend Kim sent me. Thanks again Kim. And it sounded interesting. You know if you've been around here a while that I love a good suburban dysfunction novel and this is definitely that. So let's just jump on into it. Um, I will eventually get into spoilers, but I will be sure to give you a warning before I do, because of course, I don't want to spoil this for anybody. So first, I'm just going to give a basic synopsis of the novel, and then we'll get more into the spoilers. So I'll warn you, I promise. So this book begins with um, two families. It begins with two families and it ends with two families. So we have one family. It's a woman named Valerie and her 18 year old son Xavier. Valerie is a uh, black woman and her son is a biracial man. Um, his father was white. That comes into play later. Which is why I'm mentioning it. Um, the other family are, are new to the neighborhood. They are the Whitmans and it's Brad a entrepreneur who owns a very thriving business in the area, his wife Julia and their two daughters, Juniper who's actually Brad's stepdaughter and Lily who is his full-on daughter with his wife Julia whereas Julia had Juniper before she met Brad. So right off the bat we're sort of given the feeling that these two families are going to have some tension. They moved into a pretty already established neighborhood. They ripped down a lot of trees and the house that used to be on the property that they bought to build a new big kind of luxurious house because like I said Brad owns his own business and he's quite wealthy. It's a lucrative business. He puts in a pool, it's a big beautiful house and his neighbor Valerie she is very passionate about nature and trees you know all the flora and the fauna and it just broke her heart to see these people come with their money and just cut down so many trees and so much of the wildlife but unfortunately there wasn't much that she could do aside from keeping her fingers crossed that he didn't destroy any of her property and the beloved trees on that property in the process. So soon after the Whitmans move in, um, they meet Valerie and Xavier. They meet Xavier first, they see him outside. Brad wrongfully assumes right off the bat that he's help, hired help to the family that lives beside them, not part of the family, so that just kind of sets things off on an awkward foot. Shortly after that we start to learn a bit about the two teenage kids, Xavier and Juniper. Now Xavier's a very studious young man. He's earned fantastic grades. He's a very talented classical guitarist. So good in fact that he's earned himself a scholarship to a university in San Francisco that he is so excited to attend. He's got a part-time job. The whole neighborhood knows him as just a really great kid with a really great mom. They both have just great reputations in this neighborhood. Juniper um, is also a very serious, studious young lady. She's taken a vow of purity in her earlier teenage years when her parents went through a phase where they were very much into that and were acting as though religion was a very important part of their life. But as the years went on, their parents kind of moved away from that as though it had all just sort of been a facade at the beginning of their marriage. and. Um, but Juniper had kind of really stuck to that purity. It was important to her. You know, it was something that was taught to her when she was very young and now as a teenager it's still something that's very important to her. So the families meet and it's friendly enough at first. They start to get to know each other a little bit. Valerie's not crazy about Brad after she meets him, just the kind of personality that he has it doesn't really vibe with her too much but she puts in an effort with Julia his wife inviting her to a local book club and uh, you know they're just they're being neighborly as you do so 
as you might expect, the two teenagers, Xavier and Juniper, they begin to mm, have a crush on each other. And as the days go by, kind of quietly and subtly over time, they begin to develop deeper feelings. And uh, Juniper eventually gets a part-time job at the place where Xavier works. And they get to know each other more through there. And so, basically, a good neighborhood is a very layered story of two families trying to find peace with one another, even though they're very different. It's the story of a kind of forbidden love between two teenagers. And of course, you know, you know how it feels when you're a teenager and you're in love. It feels very dramatic and very extreme. And in this story, that kind of takes on a whole life of its own. And from there, there's a bit of a crisis once we sort of get past the midway point. There's a crisis. <laughs> what I loved about this book too is it was kind of told, even though we get chapters that are from both of the family's points of view, um, there's also this overarching narrator that, while we don't know who she is, we get a feeling that she's one of the neighbors who kind of watched this all unfold. And as such, as she's talking, she speaks for the neighbors. She speaks of what she saw and what they felt as neighbors watching this all unfold from an outsider's point of view. So you get the Whitman's point of view, you get Valerie and Xavier's point of view, but then you get the outsider's point of view as well. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, all in all, I would definitely recommend A Good Neighborhood. I thought it was well written. Um, I would definitely read more from this author. Um, I will say though that it's a slow build. It's, it builds and builds and builds. And then when you get to like the final 50 pages, it's like it's reached the top of the hill and then it's rolling down and it's rolling so fast. And it seemed like maybe some of this could have started a little earlier in the book. <laughs> But at the same time, I get the point, like it adds an urgency to it as we're, you know, speeding towards the end of the book. So many things are happening that it just really ups the ante as well. So I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, as I was reading, I kind of felt like maybe this could have started, a, you know, <laughs> a couple dozen pages earlier than it did. But yeah, all in all, I loved it. And if you don't want spoilers, now's the time to click off. If you know that was enough to catch your attention, definitely duck out now before I uh, spoil anything for you. But for those of you who want to know what happens, what the crisis is, um, let's get on into it. So shortly after the Whitmans move in, Valerie notices that this beloved oak tree that's in her backyard, one that's uh, decades upon decades old, um, sustains some damage in the process of the Whitmans tearing down all of the wildlife that they tore down and, um, or forestry, I guess, that they tore down. And it's been damaged and it's dying. And Valerie is horrified. This tree meant so much to her. Xavier's dad, he passed away when Xavier was a little, a little boy and she just, that tree just meant so much to her because it was a part of him, you know, they bought this house together to have their family and now it's dying. So she consults a lawyer and the lawyer advises her to sue him, Brad. He advises her to sue him for $100,000 and for the contractor who did the work, $400,000, $500,000 in total. And Valerie, of course, at first is like, that seems extreme. And he's like, I know it does, but we need to make a point. We need to get in there and make it so these people can't come into these neighborhoods, tear things down, do what they want. We kind of need to set a precedent. And she decides to go along with it because, you know, she can see his point and Despite herself, she starts to think of all the many things she could do with $500,000. She 
She's got her son going off to, you know, a prestigious university in the fall and while well, he has a scholarship that only handles 50% of his tuition, this could pay for the rest of it. He could not have to worry. So eventually Brad gets served with the papers. He's outraged. Now the thing to know about Brad as well is as the novel goes on, it at one point become it at one point becomes a near horror story to me because we learn that Brad has inappropriate feelings towards his stepdaughter Juniper. And when I say inappropriate feelings, I mean all the way inappropriate feelings. And it's to the point where he is constantly thinking about her, wanting to be with her. It's super creepy. At one point they're home alone in the house. The mom, Julia, she's gone somewhere visiting family or something. I can't remember what it was. But once Juniper goes to bed that night, he sneaks into her room and kisses her on the lips. Um, and then manages to restrain himself and then he leaves. But Juniper hadn't been asleep. She had just been pretending to be asleep because she heard him come in and she's just, of course, horrified. <laughs> So as time goes by a little bit, she asks, you know, she's working at this point two part-time jobs, one with Xavier, one at Brad's company at his insistence, and she asks if she can maybe get a loan from her parents to get a car, and he says sure, she thinks it's going to be like a second-hand clunker, you know, uh, but he takes her to the dealership and has her pick out whatever she wants because he's creep. <laughs> Um, and it's just weird vibes all around. He also installs a tracker on her vehicle so that he can know where she is at all times. So we fast forward, Xavier and Juniper are seeing each other on a more regular basis. We have Brad who is still absolutely fuming about the lawsuit. Now one night, um, Juniper and Xavier decide that they want to take their relationship to the next level and become intimate with each other. They go to a park um, where there's a little cabin that they've arranged and they go in. Now earlier in that day Juniper had been at work at Brad's office and she left her phone there by accident. She knew she left it somewhere but she wasn't too concerned with it. But she didn't mention it to her mom. So later her mom calls Brad and asks him to take a look around the office. He finds it. He uses the tracker that he put on the vehicle to find her so he can bring her her phone. Um, he tracks her to the cabin. He opens the door and catches her and Xavier in the act. Now this is where the crisis begins because Brad bursts in like a crazed person. Um, Juniper is understandably alarmed because her stepfather is now there. Xavier is alarmed. He gets up, he kind of lunges at Brad um, and then runs. After Xavier takes off, Brad starts spinning this narrative to Juniper like, oh, oh my god, thank god I arrived. You were being attacked. He was attacking you and then he attacked me. And she's like, no, 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 I wasn't being attacked. I, I chose to be here. He's my boyfriend. But Brad's not having it and he calls the police and he has the police take her to the hospital as though she's a victim of assault, even though she keeps saying that she isn't. So as all this is going on, Brad eventually gets Julia to take the kids to his mother's house to get them out of the city. As the news trucks are coming, it's all hit the news. Xavier has been arrested. He's being charged with um, assault both on Juniper and Brad and it's just this whole thing it becomes this whole thing Brad calls in favors to the DA because he's you know he's this well-known businessman people love him and for some reason trust him and soon it's just snowballed so out of control and Juniper is not even in town anymore she's not being allowed to contact anybody and Valerie and Xavier are just horrified that all of this is happening. After Brad personally deems that this has all been going on long enough, he pulls sort of his trump card that he'd had all along in his pocket and he decides like, okay, tell Valerie and her lawyers that I will drop all charges against Xavier if she drops the lawsuit against me. So we know that this had been in his mind the whole time. 
So Valerie gets that news. She's so excited. She's like, okay, done, done. My son is obviously worth more than a stupid tree. So she, um, you know, she tells Xavier the good news. He is a little gobsmacked by the whole thing, you know, and uh, Valerie had plans to go and meet her long distance uh, boyfriend who lives a couple hours away and Xavier's like, yeah, go, go have some fun. It's been a tough few weeks for all of us. Go, have fun, I'm fine. Right before she's supposed to go, he gets a phone call from his lawyer saying that Brad had contacted the DA and asked the DA to drop the case um, because he was going, you know, he worked it out. And the DA is like, listen, do you think I'm some sort of pawn in whatever bullshit game you're running here? Because I'm not. You gave me all the evidence. It looks to me like your stepdaughter was attacked. So I'm going to carry on with this and take care of it. You can't just cancel it because you changed your mind. So Xavier gets that call from his lawyer that it's not, it's not over and it's probably never going to be over, you know. He's probably going to end up going to prison for this. You know, a 18 year old black man assaulting a underage white woman, you know, she's 17. Even though they're in the same, you know, close, he's a senior in high school and she's in the 11th grade. He's still over 18. So he goes and he buys a gun. You know, he doesn't tell his mom that it's not gonna be dropped. He goes and buys a gun. And in his mind, he's sort of planning and hoping to use it on Brad. But in the end, what ends up happening is he instead just uses it on himself. And, you know, he leaves a note for his mom and a note for Juniper because before he ends it, he finds out. Because for a while, he's like, why isn't she contacting me? He doesn't realize that she's been taken out of town, her phone taken away. She's completely isolated, unable to get in touch with him. But before he uses it on himself, he finds out that, you know, she, she didn't want this. She didn't say any of these things. It was Brad. He just took it out of control. And so he uses it on himself and he leaves a note for his mother and a note for Juniper. And the epilogue is a funeral for Xavier. And by, by the end of it, Juniper has finally been able to get away from where she was being held, held <laughs> from where she had been put at her grandparents' house. She's able to get her side of the story out. Julia's mom is horrified. She believes Juniper, thank God, and kicks Brad out. You know, they get a divorce and they try their best to get on with their lives, even though this man has done something so horrible. And so in the end, you know, both families have just been destroyed by this man. Um, Valerie's, of course, more than Julia and Juniper's, but still they've both been victim to this man and um, Juniper manages to go off to college. She keeps mementos of Xavier around her dorm room and she thinks, you know, one day I'm going to call Valerie and tell her how I'm doing and how it's all going and I hope that she picks up the phone when I call because of course, you know, it's, it's just all been so crazy. And it was very sad. <laughs> the ending, the final page, I, I shed a tear. Um, it was just, it was a beautiful, sad story. <sighs> just how I like him. <laughs> and um, like I said, I did find the ending to be a bit rushed. Like the last 40, 50 pages, just everything happened in those pages. But on the flip side, I do understand that the slow burn makes that final explosion all the more intense because you know it's coming you're waiting for it you're waiting for it you're waiting for it and then finally it arrives and uh, i kept trying to guess exactly what it was that was going to happen and because on the from the very first page we know that there's a funeral we know that there's going to be a funeral so you're kind of trying to guess whose funeral is going to be i kept going back and forth between xavier and brad and juniper i thought maybe 
I thought most likely was Xavier, maybe Brad, and then I thought also maybe Juniper, cause, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was very sad. And yeah, if you like those kind of domestic dysfunction in suburbia, then perhaps you would like this too. Once again, that's a good neighborhood. And yeah, it's lovely. The cover's so soft. I love it. And there's something interesting about the spine. No matter how much you crack it, it doesn't crease. Because I'm a spine cracker, you guys. I'm like, <sniffs> but it never creases. I don't know. I don't know what it is, how it's made. Uh, but it's made beautifully. <laughs> anyway, you guys, I hope you're doing well in quarantine and that you are staying safe and you are doing, just doing well. I hope you're doing well. And I will see you guys on Monday in another vlog. Bye.